So some of my disclosure information here. Um, so the, here's some of the co potential complications that come up that people kind of get worried the most about. Uh, so the first is the hand ischemia. Uh, secondly is uh, the ray artery trauma. Uh, and uh, then bleeding. Um, and uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about rare, the rare risk of infection, frankly. Um, so there's always one thing we talk back and forth about assessing the hand. Uh, and again, this sort of varies, as Mauricio had said, what is the local practice patterns around you? Um, the reality is that if you look at the large volume centers that have looked at and been doing this for many years, the chances of anything really bad happening to the hand is exceptionally rare. Um, the cited number from uh, Quebec, which is sort of the epicenter of where all this sort of started, is about two in 50,000 cases of having hand compartment syndrome. And so that is, and, that, and if you talk to the folks up there about how that happened, it was actually in general stupidity about uh, you know, not paying attention to what was going on. The, the one case that they had to happen was, uh, it was a Saturday and it was a new nurse and the holding area wasn't accustomed to dealing with radials and sort of just let this arm sort of kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger without really doing anything about it. And the reality is that all that stuff, even when you get into trouble at this point, is stuff you can do about it. Um, so it really, you know, the risk of having to send somebody to the operating room because of their arm, and there still is yet to be a single case report of anybody losing their arm uh, because of a radial case, okay? So um, because of that, you know, the, uh, the issues about ischemia uh, to the hand and, you know, really bad trauma to the hand, I think we're now at a point where we can kind of put that one to rest. Um, you don't care if it's a dominant hand or not? I don't typically care. The only thing, as I said before, the only groups of people I really, really care about, somebody comes in and tells me, and this is about patient preference, and there are people who really are very sensitive to their hands, and uh, you know, for those most of us who don't do things where your hands are your livelihood, and what I mean by that is, you know, my hands are my livelihood too. I mean, I, you know, catheterize people, but, you know, I'm not using them to the capacity where at, at a very fine rate and, and, and fast finger speed to the point where blood flow to the hand really is a potential real jeopardy to me. That's why I said the professional musicians are sort of the one group of people where I sort of say, you know, if you don't want me to touch your hands, fine. Uh, outside of the dominant hand, no, I don't, I don't let that get in my way at all. So, uh, and because most, most, you know, 99% of people are not doing things to the level where they're going to eventually want to have their hands kind of get into trouble with them, okay? And occluded, most radial occlusions, even if the artery is totally occluded, are asymptomatic in some. Um, Okay, but there are ways to kind of assess things if you want to do it. I think it's useful if you sort of want to repeatedly figure out how bad the artery is, if is it usable again, did something change from before and after, in part because patients do care if their artery is occluded, even though it's asymptomatic, and you want to be able to tell them that. So actually, the way to document that is by doing the assessment. Whether you need to do it to decide are you going to do the procedure from the wrist or not is a, is a different issue. Um, and so you'll have to decide for yourself if you want to put the effort into trying to do that. But when trials are looking at radial occlusions, this is how it's winds up being done. Um, so well, one of the formal ways of doing it is actually, actually a two-minute test. And uh, so you wind up actually, and these are sort of the grading scales that people have been using. This is what Barbeau was doing when he was initially describing the data, uh, is basically looking at two minutes. If you, got, you, you start off, you compress the artery, um, and then uh, looking at the ulnar artery and see whether it's actually got patency to the hand or not. And if it's two minutes out, you really are in a situation where there really is really poor collateral flow. Now, the question is that many people, that, that's the group that uh, Peter Casarello is talking about. Maybe we should have avoid doing. Frankly, I think most people have moved even beyond that and just saying, I'm still doing it. But to be able to document or grade the different types of, of categories of responses to, um, to, uh, to actually kind of get uh, to, uh, uh, in terms of the flow to the hand, this is one way of doing it. Um, the key things about radial artery occlusion are the duration of compression. In the early days of radial angioplasty, people were very worried about bad bleeding. So they would cinch down these bands on the wrists for six hours, okay, thinking that we need to sort of hold the groin like we were holding the groin. You got to hold the artery or pressure of this artery or it's going to bleed. Um, the other thing is heparin use, the sheath size, and then the, again, the type of device uh, that's being used. And so those are sort of the things that are really associated with radial artery compression. Uh, so there are a couple things that are really important that lead towards uh, improvement in that. First off, the dose of heparin, I think, has pretty much been well established that higher doses of heparin, starting at 5,000 5, units of heparin, sort of a standard, has been one of the, the things that most people have conventionally used. This is an area that still, in my opinion, needs some work. I don't know, just to get Mauricio's view about this, but, uh, you know, most areas when we use heparin, we found that weight-based nomograms for dosing heparin seem to be appropriate rather than just one-size-fits-all dosing. Um, 
in the radial world, we're not really sure about that. I mean, you know, it is pretty clear, though, that you can anticoagulate people without too much trouble. And, well, you haven't talked about the warfarin issue yet, but there's really no reason to stop anybody's warfarin to bring them in for a radial cath, and most of us are not doing that at all. Um, it's reasonable to check their INR. If it's, you know, if it's five, you probably should let it drift down a bit before you get started. But uh, somebody who's got a therapy INR is not a contraindication to going in the wrist. Um, so at any rate, uh, but the key thing is the dosing of the heparin. So if you look at the rates of radial occlusion early on when people were not giving it, there were sometimes very pretty high rates of occlusion, and now it's getting down well below uh, three to two to one percent of the time. Equally importantly, the size of the sheath has been associated with that. Now, if you look at the scale here, going from 2% to 1%, I mean, the confidence level around these numbers are probably not all that great, but th there's no question that going away down in the sheath size is helpful in terms of also reducing the chances of getting radial artery occlusion. The duration. Um, so this is a randomized study that was done by actually Samir Pinkoli uh, looking at um, uh, groups that were randomized to either 12, six hours of compression or two hours of compression and then looking at early radial artery conclusion or chronic radial artery conclusion. So the early was sort of uh, prior to discharge and was there evidence of occlusion. And, and then later on, at 30-day follow-up, was the artery had a, a reestablished flow or not. And pretty clearly, you didn't want to be in group two. Your rates were lower, meaning less compression time. So this is where the sort of number that you see in many of the nomograms come from about trying to get the, the band off within two hours' time comes from. So um, that's good for the patients. You know, they don't want the band on there any longer than they need to either. It's good for us because we can discharge the patient sooner from the holding area. It leads to same-day discharge. It leads to all the stuff that's actually good. So it turns out holding pressure on the artery for less of a time is actually good for the artery. The artery wants blood flow going down it. And uh, so that's, uh, the, the duration is actually very important. Um, so again, looking at uh, the patent hemostasis concept. So and this gets into actually now doing, looking at, are we going to use the minimal amount of pressure to avoid bleeding versus just sort of a standard amount of pressure, just kind of, you know, uh, crank down just to get the, get the bleeding under control. And you're going to randomize, again, between early and persistent uh, radial artery occlusion. Uh, again, uh, a clear, pretty clear benefit to going with a, uh, a patent hemostasis type of a hold. And that's where we're going through the, the issues where I went through at the beginning of the case, pulling back on the air on the TR band, letting to see if there's bleeding there, and then just putting enough in, air in just to barely get uh, control of the bleeding. It's pretty much become the standard convention to, for most people. As they say, if there's not blood on the TR band when you're done, you're probably not doing it right. Okay, so you ought to pull the band, you pull nice enough air out of it to find out where is that threshold about where, the, where you've barely got hemostasis. And my protocol has been to put about two cc's of air in from that point. I know what you've been doing, Mauricio, with for the TR band. Is that sort of similar? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I think that's pretty much what people have moved towards in terms of trying to really minimize radio artery occlusion. So, again, uh, you know, you've seen this, and Jeff just did, uh, did his case there. So, again, looking at uh, sort of uh, over time, um, unfortunately, I'm sorry, the background didn't come up on this, but the, looking at uh, combinations of the, the three things, that is patent hemostasis type of a hold, two hours of compression, not six, and giving heparin, and the rates of uh, radial artery occlusion have come well down below 1%, and the only other thing to add on that would be sheath size, and that it comes down to your ability to do the procedure, that is, which is one of the reasons I like to use the four franchise because I can do most of the stuff with that for at least the diagnostics. There are times where you really do need a bigger sheath, and obviously you need to, you need to do the procedure. But you know, going to smaller sheath is is uh, is, uh, is associated with uh, le uh, better radial occlusion rates. So, um, again, uh, if you want to kind of check on things, uh, there's the Barbeau test here that's sort of shown on the right. Okay. Um, the other thing that you can do is that if you get radial artery occlusion, you realize it happens before your patient sending the patient home. And this has been one of the things that's actually been discussed actually in some of the literature is that many people are not doing as good a job as we really should be at assessing the artery. We're all done, hey, yay, for us, we did a great angioplasty, time to go home. Did you actually go back and check the pulse to see if it's still there or not? Okay, that's gonna be a quality metric. I think it's likely gonna be coming down the road here for radial is just to document that in fact the artery is still patent. So that's maybe still, in my opinion, where the role for the Allen's test still may come into play is being able to say what did things look like before and after you were done, uh, just to be able to document that the artery is open. Not that it would make a decision whether you're going to do the procedure, but more for documentation. Um, one thing you can do is to turn the band around, okay? And so while you've got the patient there, if you notice that the radial artery is now occluded and before you send the patient home, 
to put the band back on and occlude the ulnar for a period of time and try to force blood down the radial artery. And they have been able to establish uh, um, a flow back down the radial in some cases. And in some people, even giving a bit of heparin as well um, is, uh, is have been associated with an improvement uh, as well. So again, things to think about if you actually encounter an occluded uh, radial artery before discharge that you could think about in terms of trying to establish patency again. Uh, radial artery trauma. The biggest issue we deal with there is spasm. Um, I think most people are sort of engaging using some sort of cocktail. There are some people who don't use any cocktail at all. Um, that's, that's another reasonable, you know, if that works for you, great. I think most people would say you need to at least have it available because if you do enough of this, you will encounter spasm. Um, we use at least uh, verapamil. That's sort of been the tried and true mechanism for some folks for many years. Um, there are other places that do it differently. Uh, I think Ian Gilchrist shop uses uh, nicardipine in a syringe. And what they've done doing lately is actually using a state of exchange link wire, just jetting the catheters off of the, uh, uh, um, out of the coronary over a standard link guide wire rather than an exchange link guide wire. And then uh, um, uh, and the, the, with the nicardipine sort of flush, that's been enough to actually get them uh, uh, enough vasodilatation, they haven't gotten too much trouble with it. So that's another way of doing it. There was a verapamil shortage about a year and a half ago, and people were wondering what to do. Nicardipine is another great answer uh, if you run out of verapamil. Um, yeah. Verapamil's cheap. I think it's 100, isn't it? Nicardipine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two, 300 bucks. Yeah. yeah. So um, sedating the patient is actually very important. And so when people are anxious, they tend to be more vasoconstricted. And so because of that, uh, that's another thing you can encounter when you, when you uh, deal with spasm, with spasm. You want to monitor when you're changing catheters out as to how well the catheter is coming out. You may notice that it gets to be a bit more resistance in terms of pulling the catheter as opposed to when you put it in. When I change the catheters, you know, I've got the tech doing a lot of it. Usually I'll start the pullback just to get a sense about how tight is this catheter around the, around the artery. Uh, and uh, if it's tight, then I might add on a little bit of nit nitroglycerin into the sheath at the, at the catheter exchanges to try to make sure that the artery's staying open. Um, you want to try to minimize catheter manipulation and twerking. The one of the things that I've learned is that if you really got to, for example, the, uh, using a lot, but a lot of four French catheters, if you're having to do a lot of twerking manipulation of the catheter, it's time to move up. And just, it, it, you're, you're gonna, what, all you're going to want to do in that situation is create more spasm. And then when you really get bad spasm, you can't move the catheter at all. And that becomes a very frustrating experience. So if you start seeing I'm having to twerk and you know, doing all sorts of gyrations to get the catheter to go into the coronary, it's time to abandon the four French and go up to five. Um, you haven't encountered the spasm yet, but you're going to get more deliverability of the catheter. You're going to be able to deliver the you're going to get more support and get in the catheter where you want it to go. And that's the time to do it. You want to do that before you provoke the spasm, and now you really are in the soup and you can't get anything done. So uh, just pay attention to that. Um, and that's uh, uh, one of the things I've encountered. Uh, at least in my experience of, of, uh, of when to change out. Uh, but again, using smaller sheets, doing everything through a six French sheet, I think most people sort of moved away from. But a six French sheet certainly has its uses. I mean, you're going to need it for most for uh, angioplasties or the sheathless guides if you're going to do you know, bifurcation lesions and things like that from the wrist. Um, the treatment. Again, the first thing is if you encounter spasms, to start sedating the patients. Uh, that's the key thing. Um, the second thing is, of course, you can also give sublingual nitroglycerin. Uh, or you can put uh, nitroglycerin into the IV that will help it help dilate things. Um, the other thing is that you can give a, a little bit of IV diltiazem as long as you have the blood pressure to deal with it. Um, the other things I've done if I've had the catheter at least upstream and there's still spasm and I'm still able to flush the catheter is to administer some more uh, calcium channel blocker through the, cal through the, through the catheter because it's going to flush downstream and hopefully dilate things out. So that's another approach in terms of dealing with spasm uh, to try to deal with things. Um, the last thing is that it, there are uh, cases that have been described where people have had trouble getting the catheter out. What you don't want to do in that situation is do one of these, you know. Uh, the, the thing to do in that situation is if you really have tried everything, you can't get it out, you sedated the patient and so forth, the last resort is to get anesthesia, come down and do a nerve block on the patient and whomp, the, 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 the artery will just dilate right on out. Okay, so you don't need to do, put them under general anesthesia to do this. But if they do have nerve block, they'll basically, uh, you'll take away the uh, vasoconstrictive component to it. Um, so those are sort of the, you know, the things you, you can do that sort of in your bag of tricks uh, when you encounter spasm of, uh, of what to do. Okay. Pseudoaneurysms and AV fistulas are very rare. Um, I think I had one pseudoaneurysm so far, and I've been doing this now for, uh, gosh, I have almost eight, nine years. So 
Um, the, uh, so they, they happen, usually because it's actually in the wrist as opposed to the groin. It's a much more compressible kind of a thing, and usually it can be compressed with ultrasound and it will go away. Um, so that's when it happens. The, the, what will typically will happen is the patient will call you complaining that they still have pain at their site. So, which is pretty unusual actually after a radial procedure actually, particularly if you get you know, beyond it a couple days after it. If they're still having it, then the answer is to ultrasound the artery and see what's going on. And if you happen to have an AV fistula, usually it's compressible and you can kind of get rid of it. So that's sort of the answer there. Um, there are other rare things that have been described. Again, there's the AV fistula up there that you see by ultrasound. And the other thing is the pseudoaneurysm. Again, you, more often than not, you can try to compress it or either inject it just like you would do uh, with a pseudoaneurysm in the groin, okay? Uh, bleeding, okay. So what we're talking about is perforations in the arm. And um, so the, the classic scenario, there's sort of several places where you can get bleeding. The biggest issue is if you start getting it up here in the elbow because these are bigger arteries and are tending to be able to bleed a little bit more vigorously. But the classic thing is to get a mid forearm hematoma. And this is a sort of why you want to be careful when you're advancing the wire. That's why when I've got the first case that I was doing, or the second case I was doing, when I kept getting access and I would put the wire in and it would stop, you don't want to push harder, okay? Because the wire is going to go someplace. And where it's frequently going to go is either in a dissection plane that you're already in or it's going to go into a branch in the mid part of the artery, of, in the mid part of the forearm, perforate, and then give you a mid forearm hematoma. And uh, so uh, the, the wire, when you pass on the radial, should feel smooth. It should feel like you're used to feeling when you go in from the groin doing a, a standard femoral case. And so um, the key thing is to re recognize it and actually have an appropriate response sort of set up in terms of what to deal with it. Most of the time, that usually involves um, getting a blood pressure cuff. Okay, so that's sort of your, your, your go-to uh, uh, piece of equipment when you get there. If it happens while you're still proceeding on with the case, the case is not over. In fact, the right thing to do is to proceed because what you're going to do is put a catheter across where the area is perforated and basically create tamponade over it. So uh, you'll see, it, and I've got several examples of cases where we created a perforation even up in the, in the forearm, but the case wasn't done yet. And so we put the catheter up there, we we'll proceeded on with the case. At the end of the case, shot another angiogram, and lo and behold, the perforation was sealed off. Okay, so uh, so that yeah, I would not uh, dissuade you from continuing on the case just because you, you've identified that there's some bleeding in there. In fact, what you really want to do is occlude the artery, and 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 then the coag and then the uh, the natural uh, uh, coagulants will take over. Yeah. Uh, I usually just proceed on with the case like I normally do. Yeah, I just keep doing it. Yeah, yep. I keep doing it. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. What's your lower threshold for platelet value? Platelets? Yeah, because we have a very strong uh, liver transplant program. No, I don't know. And I've done, I've done patients with INRs of three and places yeah. of 10,000. I was going to say, when you get down below 20, I start asking questions, but then you know, we start what we need to do. But, I mean, from the wrist, you know, you're, you're going to get hemostasis. So. Well, the point is, when you get a complication, you lose that point. Yeah. So, that, well, let's talk about where you are in the case, all right? So, uh, we'll proceed on here in a minute here. But if you're just starting the case, and as long as the arm isn't ridiculously blowing up, okay? And more often than not, you find this out because you were in there and you got a problem, and then you shot a radio, you shot an angiogram to see what's going on, and lo and behold, there's extravasation, okay? So the answer in that situation, as long as the arm isn't completely going out of control, which is really rare, frankly, is to get a catheter across that and proceed on, okay? Um, usually at that point, you've already given the heparin because it's usually right after you've given the sheet. I would not reverse the heparin quite yet, okay? I would let the, let the catheter have a chance while you're up there kind of, you know, doing a few things and getting your angiogram. I take your time doing it, so you give it, and then you got to change the catheter out. But yes, you can change the catheter out, put another one in, uh, and then at the end of the case, then you shoot an angiogram to figure out where, where things are. If they're still bleeding there, then yeah, you still got an issue. At that point, then you're going to want to reverse the heparin. Okay, so that's where the protamine comes in. And then what the other thing to do is to put a blood pressure cuff over the site where you think the bleeding is. What I typically tend to do is blood put, it, put it up, figure out what the systemic pressure is, and then go maybe 10 points below that. And so you don't want to be completely occluding the artery. You want to be just below it. And that's usually enough. I leave it on for five minutes and then take it off and recheck and see if there's a hematoma there or not. And then you can wait a few minutes. If it still looks like it's still expanding, put it back on. Um, usually between the combination of giving the protamine 
and putting the blood pressure cuff on, you're going to get control over the bleeding. So. Even if you're driving around at 2.9. Yep. Okay. Yep. Did you agree, Mauricio? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's that's the reason why there's sort of this upper limit that you know I think uh, Samir Bacoli threw out one time. So look, he's he's uncomfortable doing it for now. He's been doing this for 25 years. So. Uh, you know, and, and, and in private practice. So that, you know, he's sort of done enough of this and, you know, created his own injuries enough to understand where is that threshold. And he sort of said, look, you know, this is just common sense. You know, if your INR is way super therapeutic, bring it down to at least to the therapeutic range. But once you're in the therapeutic range, it's perfectly reasonable to continue on. Yeah. Um, so again, a lot of times this stuff will happen well after the procedure. So what will happen is you put the TR band on, the things look fine. They get back to the recovery area where they were going to go, and then you know your pager goes off, and the nurses say, uh, "So and so's arm looks like it's getting bigger." Okay, this is sort of so. Then you need to sort of figure out what the answer is. The first issue is where are we with the TR band, and is it you know uh, is this you do put the air back in it? The second issue is where is the bleeding? Where is the the form the hematoma seeming to come from? So what you really want to do is at that point you're not going to go back in and start looking for bleeding. What you're just going to want to do is get compression on it, and that's again. Reversing the heparin, and then again putting the putting the blood pressure cuff on over the site where the bleeding is, and having a reasonable protocol as to when to recheck. You don't want to leave the a blood pressure cuff sitting up on an, over an extremity for you know 30 minutes. That's a you're going to create ischemia and nerve imagery if you do that. But five minutes is not going to be a big issue, and then recheck it. And that's sort of a reasonable protocol to kind of go through to check and see you know and get control of the bleeding. Okay. Um, so again. <laughs> strategies, it sort of depends on where you are in the case. Um, again, it's pretty rare to get an access site hematoma while you have the sheath in place. Um, you can do it basically if you actually have repeatedly, like I was in the second case, I was doing traumatizing the vessel over and over again to try to get into it and being failing at access. That can happen. More often than not, the mid forearm is because the wire's gotten out of side branch and then perforated. Uh, and then the elbow is usually when you've gotten into one of these anatomic variants and the wire's kind of gotten through into one of the radial loops and up the recurrent radial or out of side branch off the radial loop or something like that. Uh, and those are the ones because the artery is much bigger at that point. It's really sort of the end of the brachial artery that they can bleed a bit more. And that's why you want to sort of pay attention to those particularly. Um, again, looking at the incidents, this is sort of the guys in Quebec kind of came up with this, is that the frequently they, they will see sort of some bruising sort of at the, at the access site when the case is over. But uh, and that's the most common thing. But these episodes that happen way up here in the, in the mid-arm are pretty very rare. And the elbow bleeds are sort of the ones that you, uh, you spend a little bit more time worrying about. Again, uh, the strategy um, is, again, uh, for, the, for the middle ones, uh, again, even putting ice on it sometimes can help a bit if it's a very small hematoma. But the blood pressure cuff is really the thing that's uh, the, the strategy to kind of deal with things uh, at the elbow. Um, if you are getting into compartment syndrome, probably medically, legally, the right thing to do is just call vascular surgery and make sure that they don't really want to do anything about it. Again, that's pretty unusual. But again, this is a situation where they're going to want, you know, you'd rather have, like most things with vascular surgery, they would rather hear about it now than hear about it at 2 in the morning uh, when they have to go kind of go and deal with something. So, um, so uh, let's see here. Can you play this? Let's see here. Oh, uh, that's too bad. All right. Um, maybe I'll show. I think I have the examples from this case from tomorrow. But this is the sort of one where we had actually created a perforation. Uh, and uh, uh, there was basically, I'll kind of describe what we saw. There's extravasation out here in the elbow. This is right at the beginning of the case. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, at the end of the case. And you can see at the end of the case, after we applied uh, uh, the blood pressure cup over the arm there, uh, and you can show, we had actually at the end of the case, I play, it had. Uh, uh, put a uh, renal, um, put a shot of renal angiogram, an angiogram here, and the extravasation was totally gone. So it will seal off, uh, and it's just something to be aware of, and you know how to deal with it and proceed on with the case. Uh, let's see. So this is what you don't want to see. Okay, uh, this is the one case I think from Quebec that everybody shows, and it can be dealt with. Okay, and it's very rare. And it's very preventable. Uh, the incidence is two hundred fifty thousand cases or something like that. Okay, so. Um, rare. What about pectorals? Okay, so you can get the thing that's the problem here. This is a situation where somebody let the glide wire get too far down into the chest and then perforated one of the, like the long thoracic artery. Okay, 
and then what you'll wind up getting is a hematoma here. So uh, again, if you're using the glide wire, e glide wire equals fluoro. Um, the J-tip wires, no. You can kind of move those around without too much trouble. But th this is a situation that comes up when you're not paying attention to where uh, uh, the, uh, a, a more dangerous wire is. Okay, again, uh, here's the blood pressure cuff again. Okay, 10 millimeters below the systemic pressure, release in five minutes, okay? And then recheck, all right? Um, the final thing, this is we don't see anymore, but this was the original thing with some of the uh, coatings on the uh, Cook hydrophilic sheath, uh, which is what wound up, they wound up having these uh, access, sort of these um, uh, uh, sterile abscesses that were noted there. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the good news is I think this sheath is well off the market and hasn't shown up again. Um, so that's, uh, uh, but just to be aware of that, that these things have been described. If, you, if people talk about it, uh, that you're aware of it. So again, uh, don't freak out. Uh, most of the occlusions are symptomatic, asymptomatic. Um, use patent hemostasis in uh, small sheaths and heparin uh, and uh, a lot, a shorter um, uh, hold times, and that will help you. Uh, the uh, prophylaxis for spasm. Uh, and then um, you can continue this, the procedure for small perforations. And then, uh, um, and what that I mean is that, you know, a big perforation is something you see the arm, you know, expanding in front of your very eyes while you're looking at it. So like what people, you know, I think everybody's seen one of those in the groin. Uh, but, and that's a different animal, obviously, you gotta deal with that. But that's pretty rare, I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen one before starting the procedure that I've ever encountered. Um, at the end of the procedure, sometimes it comes up and even then it's, it's not nearly as dramatic as often as what we see with the groins that sort of go up and blow up. So I'll stop there. Questions about uh, complication management? Yeah. They've been usually done, so they put the TR band back on, uh, usually for about an hour, and then seeing what happens, okay? And then reassessing it, letting it down, seeing if anything, anything else has come up. So that's sort of about the, the time course that people have done to deal with it. It's not for six hours or so. No. Mm -hmm.